Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kevin Dole. I'm your host today for our webinar. Um, great to have you here. Today we're having Merck Leader Conversations, optimizing parcel delivery for today's consumer. I have some great guests here today, two fantastic leaders, a visible supply chain management, a Merck company, but not just any Merck company actually, one that's been around for 30 years and currently handles 200 million e-commerce parcels a year through their systems overall. Really, really fantastic. So um, I'm gonna introduce my guests here, my speakers, Casey Adams, who is the president of Visible overall. He's president, he's an industry veteran. Um, he's led tremendous growth over the years and he's an attorney, an economist and an Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year. So welcome Casey, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, hello everyone. Fantastic. And then we also have Jim, who is the head of commercial Another industry veteran with tremendous experience and many leadership roles at XPO and Tompkins International. So welcome, Jim. Great to have you here. Great. Nice to be here. Excited to have a conversation with everyone. Okay, cool. We are going to be doing um, our agenda. It's a three-part discussion today, a simple, very, a very simple framework. Part one is what, what customers want. Part two is the challenges that businesses face. And then part three, or what do businesses need? What capabilities do they need? in order to be successful to literally deliver the goods. It, it's very simple as that. Um, we're gonna share some slides and stories, and we're asking you to submit your slides into the chat, and our moderators will collect them, and we're gonna address them at the, end of the, at the end of the session. So first, I wanna kinda get into it with you, Jim. What do consumers want? And let's go to the next slide while I try to stop my computer from pinging. Go ahead, guys. Great. So I always find it really interesting when you think about consumer expectations and not only how do they continue to increase, but how these four elements of convenience, speed, selection and price have really always been the way you look at customer experience, but they take on a very different meaning in the lens of the e-commerce landscape and specifically around e-delivery and parcel final mile. So when you think about convenience, in the past it was where was the store located? Today, it's really about how am I gonna be able to get the product that I want? Can I go and pick it up at the store after I order it online? Can I get it the next day? Am I okay getting it free and maybe a little slower? So all of those pieces come into convenience. They also play back into speed. Everybody does want everything faster. The Amazon effect that really has trained the world that the world should come to you in two days is no different in any other category that's out there. So speed continues to be more and more critical. And then lastly, in terms of delivery and price, consumers have a very interesting trade-off that they make between speed and price. Many times, if you offer a good speed to delivery and it's free, very acceptable, very little uh, cart abandonment, and it's a very strong value prop for your brand. If the customer does want it the next day, you have to be able to execute on that. So what does that mean overall when you look at consumer expectations? And then how do sellers now need to really build a unified shopping experience when you think of the dynamics between an online and an offline world? So first and foremost, e-commerce sellers have to think about their brand equity and how do they grow that online and they grow that through a very engaged relationship with their consumers how do they do that they do it by knowing what their consumers are buying presenting offers to them in making sure that they're engaged throughout the customer journey. So really having an integrated capability from browsing to shopping to placing that order and then ultimately getting that delivery, whether that is an online or offline or meandering between online and offline, that that journey is very, very integrated and seamless across all the channels that the customer wants to engage with your brand. And then lastly, it's really critical 
that you have what you, the customer wants when they want it. And so inventory availability, really important, being able to deliver it in the time frame that the customer expects, really requires on having the inventory where it needs to be and to be able to execute on that order in a timeless way, a timely way, as well as an affordable way for you, the seller, so you're not losing money on that online order in order to make, meet the customer's uh, requirements. So it's a very interesting landscape that has changed and evolved, but really is still rooted in some basics around what customer experience means. Yeah, it's really interesting, Jim, especially the way that these trends have been pulled forward. You know, I think the global pandemic has pulled together trends that may have taken years to play out, but in fact, they've actually played out only, only over a matter of months, right? So that's that's changing everything. So it really leads me to the next question. And the question is for Casey, like, so just what happened? You know, it seems like this consumer demand has created tremendous pain points for, for businesses trying to serve that demand. And I'm, I'm curious as to what kind of conversations you've been having, what you've been seeing from a trend perspective. Yeah. So, so what happened? That's a that's a great question, um, and I, I I think that Jim's brought up a wonderful point, which is that the the e-commerce logistics supply chain is a delicate instrument. Uh, it it was made based on this balance between costs, speed, convenience, the customer expectations, and as a result of it being a relatively delicate instrument, it, it didn't take very much to throw it off. Now, it, it had historically been growing between 15 and 20 percent uh, year over year right so some very good aggressive sustained growth uh, in e-commerce logistics here in the us and in and, and in e-commerce retail sales and and as you can see on the chart here you can see that growth over time very predictable and and the capacity to support that delicate instrument that jim was referencing the capacity to support that instrument uh, was growing incrementally. There were some bumps along the way. I, I think everyone remembers uh, the the peak of um, oh, it would have been 2015 um, when when there was a, a surge in volume right around that Black Friday event, and and no one was really quite ready for it, and it over it, it, it kind of crushed the system a little bit. But the the carriers, UPS, FedEx, the Postal Service, they've been doing a very good job over the last half decade of managing. Uh, this consistent growth of this delicate instrument. Then the global pandemic hit. And um, I, I, I hate to be uh, glib about it, but it resulted in, in a pig and a python situation. A huge amount of volume was dumped into the delicate instrument that was e-commerce logistics. Uh, and and uh, that pig started working its way through the python. You can see it on this chart uh, with that growth from 2019 to 2020, which is dramatically outsized from the historical growth curve. Um, it, it actually was a little bit uh, overrepresented in parcel delivery as opposed to just uh, the volume of growth as people weren't able to go and pick up and store. So one of those convenience options that Jim referenced uh, was, was not even available to alleviate some of the impact. So that pig started working its way through the Python and that resulted in some very strange outcomes. Uh, Chelsea, if we move to that next slide. You, you can see some of this impact here on parcel volume instead of on e-commerce revenue. You, you look at this growth uh, pattern and you're seeing about a billion uh, parcels per year of new growth. You see 2014 to 2015, uh, point, uh, point 0.7 billion. You see 2015 to 2016, about a billion. Again, very predictable growth. And as, as everyone knows who works in manufacturing or supply chain, predictable growth is good. Uh, then as you go from 19 to 20, you see that the parcel volume increased uh, by, by a, a little more than 5 billion parcels, right, or, or, or right around that range. And, and frankly, to put that into scale, as you're thinking of, well, how many, how many parcels actually is that? That's the total number of parcels UPS delivered in 2020. UPS, the, the, the shipping behemoth, that was the amount of growth experienced in e-commerce supply chain and parcel growth. So really dramatic change, that 5 billion uh, parcel growth, and the system wasn't ready for it. Just being frank, it just wasn't ready for it. And, and so what did that then engender? Let's see what some of the fallout from it was. If we go to the next slide, you can see how the carriers manage this. And, and 
This slide is actually really interesting. We got it from our friends over at Pitney Bowes. You can see parcel volume growth by carrier here, but also interestingly, you can see percentage growth. Um, and that's telling us a lot. And I think it's something that, that everybody who was on this call probably experienced, trailer caps, where the carrier called, maybe with a lot of notice, maybe with a little notice, but they called and told you they weren't gonna pick up your parcels. Some of these carriers were at the edge of their system and they were supposed to be, right? A very good supply chain is very efficient, it has great throughput. And, and so you wanna have those carriers at the edge of their capacity most of the time. You can see UPS was only able to absorb an additional 13% of the parcel volume. Uh, FedEx was only able to absorb 22% uh, of the parcel volume. And so they were forced into a, a situation where they had to cap the trailers and, and, and not take in any new parcels as this new 5 billion parcels started working its way through the system. Um, now that, that makes a really bad outcome for uh, for, for a retailer or a brand that has come to rely on that for their convenience and rely on that for their e-commerce delivery. Um, we had an example that, that really was poignant to me. A 3PL up in Minnesota reached out to us and they had just received their, their volume allocation from a major carrier. And that volume allocation was 50% of what they expected it to be. And so they weren't able to tender half of what they needed to tender in, or, in order to satisfy their customers' needs. And the product that they were shipping out, the product that was driving this 3PL's growth was COVID test kits. Now, remember, this is in third quarter of 2020. There was no vaccine. Um, there, there, there were, everyone was struggling to be tested, struggling to confirm whether they had COVID or not so that they could mitigate the impact of it. And, and this 3PL was not able to shift, uh, to ship half of the volume um, that, that they were expected to ship. Really serious problem. Um, and, and so that problem, I think, uh, pervaded the entire space. Now, who were our heroes? Who came in and saved the day? Because like I mentioned, this wasn't an issue of the carriers uh, being uh, Grinches as they stared at Christmas or something like that. This was a situation where the carriers were at capacity. Um, and so what, who saved the day? And what happened that was interesting in 2020, at least from my perspective? Well, the, the first person I have to laud is saving the day was Amazon. If you look at this chart, Amazon actually became in 2020, the third largest final mile carrier in the, U, in the United States. Now, okay. let, let me let that sink in for a second. This isn't just Amazon moving parcels somewhat or picking and packing orders. This is Amazon uh, jumping from less than 2 billion parcels of delivery, right? All the way up to 4.2 billion parcels of delivery. Now they, they were responsible for even more parcels than that, that still went out through UPS, US Postal Service, et cetera. But they became a material deliverer and, and really helped to save 2020 for e-commerce. I think all of you saw those vans start moving around, right? They showed up in your neighborhood where they never were before. You used to see the postman every day, the UPS guy and the FedEx guy a couple of times a week. And then all of a sudden Amazon was there and they were there a lot. And, and they ran some really cool and really unique models to, to build capacity very quickly, to scale up very rapidly with those, uh, those Amazon Sprinter vans. Um, and, and they effectively saved uh, the e-commerce expectations uh, that Jim was referencing. They, they restored some life to that system by taking a substantial volume. Um, the next big hero who came in was the US Postal Service. Uh, not a lot of people are aware, but the Postal Service is required to accept the tender of packages. They're required to accept the tender of mail. Uh, so they weren't able to do trailer caps. They weren't able to protect their networks like UPS and FedEx had to do. So they had to accept whatever was tendered to them. And I think a lot of the people who are on this, uh, on this webinar today probably uh, took parcels that were otherwise going to UPS or FedEx uh, historically and, and gave them to the Postal Service and said, hey, can, can you deliver these for us? That I think, put, yeah, I, I think you, you, you bring up a good question in terms of like, some of the heroes who got who saved the day, but what happened to the companies? And maybe I'll even ask this question for Jim. What what were the consequences of companies that didn't get the experience right, that did not get e-delivery correct? What what happened to them? What was what was the end result? Well, I think there were a number of different consequences. So when you, when you first think about what happens when these supply chains really get strained and unable to perform, customers don't get the service that they're used to getting, and so you may look at that and say, okay, well, it's expected, 
But when more and more of your business is going online and that portion of your business is becoming a bigger percentage of your overall growth and you're dissatisfied your customers by your service levels, it's a material impact on your brand, on your brand equity and your ability to continue to grow in the market. So first and foremost, it was unhappy customers. Then you look at the more operational and financial impacts of that for the companies themselves, the sellers themselves. And this chart really highlights how the rates just exploded through this when you know peak surcharges and COVID charges and all of these things came to light, the cost to serve just became significantly higher. And they really were stuck because they didn't have alternative methods already set up. So the last impact was a real impact and a consequence of not having agility in their supply chain. So if customers were not getting what they wanted and sellers were looking for alternatives, but they weren't able to shift to other carriers in a seamless way, then they were having the impact of increased costs, increased customer dissatisfaction, because they didn't have this agility. And so it became really understood that for so many years, people used to think in the, in the business was, you know, I go to, you know, purple or brown and they're my guys and that's who I go with and I get good service there and I get preference and treatment there. But what happens was that they were getting capped and they didn't have a system in place in order to even route to reach Okay, I think I might have dropped my sound for a moment. So that lack of agility really created a problem and a big consequence. And I think looking forward, you can see where part of that is now coming to fruition is people are really leaning in to utilizing the USPS as an alternate and as a, a complement to the systems that they already have in place. As Casey mentioned, they by law cannot refuse packages. They have to take your packages. And the capacity that they have in 21, they delivered 13.2 billion pieces in the year. And they did that at a remarkably high success rate of less than three days for an average delivery. And they did that because when 2020 hit and they saw that they had this requirement and they needed to build out infrastructure, they did that. At the same time, it's part of their longer term strategy to be more and more in the package business as they face declining letter volumes. And so the USPS became a real natural for customers and sellers to really start including into their overall strategy. We don't show the slide here, but when you look at the performance of USPS in 2021, it was best in class. It was no longer that difficult poor service post office that you were used to. Commercially, they were maybe not as easy to do business with, and there's things that we happen to do to help that piece, but their delivery performance in 2020 peak was best, to, best in class. And so that agility piece often includes USPS as an appropriate part of putting in additional capacity for the right packages going to the right zones, and it became a very evident piece of what people are thinking about as they move forward and become just much more understanding that a multi-carrier solution is something that has to be a part of everybody's parcel strategy. Well, thank you, Jim. I mean, I know that that- Kevin, if I could, I'd like to just double down on what Jim yeah. said on the best-in-class delivery time. Um, you know, that that's an analysis by a third-party organization. Um, who, who tracks actually parcels for UPS. 
And, and that organization identified that the Postal Service delivered on time at a higher percentage uh, than, than any other uh, than any other carrier this past year. And that in fact, um, the Postal Service delivered 97% of their parcels on time. And, and that's on more days of available delivery window. So it's not just a TNT measurement where you're measuring the time in transit with all sorts of, uh, of, of fine uh, language at the bottom of the contract, but, it, but it's actually a real human day uh, of 2.7 days to deliver. So they really did ramp up impressively in order to deliver more parcels as demanded by the, by the surge of volume. Sorry, go ahead, Kevin. No, I think you guys are making me feel very good about my taxes at work. And so I think everybody in the call is gonna be uh, <laughs> very pleased. I think I'd also point out that I understand that 13.2 billion figure is just peak season. And that's everything, but that's just between uh, Thanksgiving and the holiday. Yeah. So I, I think we've laid a lot of great groundwork in terms of what the consumer want and then what we've all been through and what we've been experiencing and, and how the landscape has changed in terms of the carriers and what they've been doing and how they've been changing. So, so let's talk about this next portion of what businesses need to do in order to deliver the goods. And it really, my understanding here is it, it, there's two main capability areas, that this final mile parcel optimization piece, but then also multi-carrier solutioning is how do you work with these different you know, parties overall? So uh, Casey, I'll go back to you in terms of, you know, what are the kind of key, key items that you need to keep in mind for that parcel optimization piece of it? Yeah, so so the the most important thing for parcel optimization, uh, unfortunately, isn't something you can you can control directly, and and it's volume of packages. Uh, nothing allows you to go uh, multi-carrier or to optimize your network quite like a, a huge volume of packages. That also, of course, does put you in a position where you've got a whole lot of work to do. But that's the first and most important thing. You've got to have a volume of packages uh, in order to to do the best that you can do. Uh, the second thing is package density. Um, lanes of package density are extremely important. Or maybe you could say volume of packages and package density are really one thing. But, but that increased volume of packages uh, does allow you to generate package density. Um, and, and that density is what the carriers want. A, an important thing to note here, Kevin, is that their most efficient package is a package that's picked up with another package and delivered with another package. So if you think about that, in order to make that carrier uh, system optimized, you wanna tender them a lot of packages on one end and you want them to be able to deliver a lot of packages on the other end, that's their best scenario. So anytime that you have that, they're gonna give you great discounts in order to support their network. Um, and they will even work on a region by region basis in order to increase that volume density in that region. So for example, I have, I've had warehouses in the Midwest, the Southeast, uh, the inner mountain west i've had warehouses on the coasts and and when i have great density i'm able to negotiate better pricing even on a per warehouse basis within my greater uh, uh negotiated agreement with that carrier so volume and package density are extremely important um the the next thing that i find incredibly important is to to know your carriers to know what they want where they want it and when they want it um and to know yourself uh, so that you can build out that multi-carrier model. And I'll show you an example of this if we move to the next slide. Um, we have on this slide uh, a parcel weight and volume optimization, but this is actually before the optimization happens. What I'm giving you is a single carrier look at a parcel data set. You can see there's a little over 300,000 parcels in this parcel data set. Um, and, and, and here's where you get to the bad punchline. Um, the average price, if you put all of those parcels on this single carrier, the average price is gonna get you almost to $16 a parcel, which is not a very good price structure. I'll just put that out there. Um, and so how do, you, how do you think about your business? How do you think about your carriers? And how do you look at this data um, in order to decide what you want to do uh, to optimize your parcels. So here's the way I would approach this data set that you're looking at right here. Um, as, as we're moving left to right across the top there, you can see a delivery area surcharge. There's also a, a surcharge called an extended area surcharge. Those two surcharges are present on about one third of all e-commerce parcels going to a residence. 
right? Uh, and, and the average impact of those surcharges is about $2.50 to $2.75. So it's a material change in price if you've got a larger than normal uh, amount of delivery area surcharge or extended area surcharge. A carrier that charges you delivery area surcharge or extended area surcharge uh, would be more expensive if you have a lot of that represented in, in your customer's network. It's, it's very logical, right? And, and so you want to identify then a carrier if you have a lot of rural, if you have a lot of people on farms buying your product, you're going to want to identify a carrier that doesn't charge you that surcharge, or you're going to want to negotiate that surcharge down. I'll give you a good example. Um, if you had a, um, a company that, that we have some familiarity with who has uh, farm products and ranch products, right? Uh, that company was representing nearly 50% of their parcels with these additional surcharges. And so by utilizing a carrier that didn't have those surcharges, we were able to save them incrementally on each package a lot of money. And, and that, that worked out to be a better network, right? So, so that's one way to think about it. Moving, moving further to the right, you can see we took what's a, a standard weight zone chart and we created a heat map. And you really need to know your heat map if you want to optimize your volume. This heat map is broken into weights running down the left-hand side and zones across the top. And then within each cell, you can see the quantity of parcels impacted in that cell. So as you, as you look at this analysis, I've taken the liberty uh, of circling three pieces of this, uh, of this distribution uh, so that I can think about how to optimize uh, this parcel spend. You can see the first um, red box there is for under a pound. Uh, under a pound parcels are, uh, they're, they're good in some ways, they're machinable, right? Um, and so you can actually run them through, uh, if the network has the machining capability, you, you can run them through as though they're mail in some ways. And, and that's, a, that's a very uh, fast and efficient way to process those parcels. Um, but they're, they're also very low cost. So there's not a lot of room to make a good margin per parcel. And if your fixed cost for delivery um, is, is, is relatively high, that can have a very bad impact on the carrier's profitability. So knowing those things can help you to break out that under one pound and think about it. Think about, do I wanna send this on a fast service or a slow service? If I'm gonna send it on a slow service, who's going to be my final mile delivery uh, carrier? And how should I think about that? And then also, can I aggregate this volume with other similar parcels so that it gives some density within that carrier's network? Again, volume and density is extremely important as we think about this. Then moving down to that second box there, you can see that that box basically represents parcels from two pounds to uh, up to 12 pounds, and, and that you have a high amount of density in, in zones two, three, and four. Well, I can learn a lot by looking at that density in zones two, three, and four. Uh, one thing that I can learn here is that this looks like a bi-coastal parcel distribution. Someone is shipping with at least two and maybe more than two fulfillment, um, fulfillment centers. That does drive down your cost, as long as you have sufficient density to make it worth it for the carrier to pick up those parcels. As I look at that, uh, that distribution, I need to ask myself, uh, my, myself about my customer uh, expectation and my customer's uh, uh, time and transit requirements? Do I have a service level agreement with my customers to deliver those parcels in three days? Do I have a service level expectation from my customers of seven to 10 days, or do they not even know when the parcel is arriving? All of those things can help with my optimization. If they don't know when the parcel is arriving, I can use a slower service method. Uh, if I need to get it there quickly, I, I need to use a faster service method. Or in an alternative to this, I may find that my average zone is a zone five, in which case that, that um, shipper probably only has a single node within the domestic US. And that would mean that that person uh, to meet their SLAs probably has to use a faster service type, which is more expensive. Um, just as, as some, some metrics to think about, a second day air product can cost you, uh, you know, 20, $25, as opposed to a ground product, which might cost you 10 to $12, as opposed to a mail product, which could cost you, uh, you know, starting at, in the five and $6 range. So, so that time in transit really is relevant. Um, so that would be the next thing I think about is, okay, what's my expectation of time in transit by my customers, especially on the different types of things that I'm shipping. 
And then we also have a nice uh, interesting lump of packages uh, for this customer that, that, that's quite a bit more heavy. Uh, you can see as you look at that third box, you have a lump of packages you're gonna need to, need to negotiate around because a, a carrier that is well suited for that machinable product up at the top, that sub one pound product, may not be the same carrier that's well suited for an 18 pound or a 20 pound parcel. Or secondarily, if you have enough package density, you, you may want to negotiate a, a, an agreement around that lump of weight um, for that 15, 16, 17 pound parcel, an agreement around that fast two to five pound parcel, and a third agreement, maybe with a, even a third carrier around that sub one pound parcel. So that would be uh, the ways that you would think about this volume optimization around your parcel weight um, and, and around your zone of your distribution. The, the point of this all is to prepare yourself to stop making your interaction with your carriers a tactical interaction but start making it a part of your strategy. Your point of contact with your e-commerce customer is this carrier. And, and what it is that you're doing with this e-commerce customer is in and around this package. So if you, if you miss the mark, if you choose the wrong carrier or you choose a single carrier and hope that they can be all things to all people, you get to a really poor outcome. And worst of all, if we, if we don't learn from 2020 where those carrier, um, those carriers were forced to cap the amount of, of parcels they could pick up. If, if you aren't prepared for that, that negative supply uh, chain shock, you'll find yourself with parcels sitting on your dock or with an emergency uh, negotiation with a carrier where you don't have any, any leverage. And, and now you just have to take whatever you can get and hope that whatever you got is sufficient to meet your customer's expectations so that you don't have the card abandonment that Jim referenced earlier, so that you don't have uh, the negative impact on your brand and on your brand uh, equity that can happen with a bad carrier experience and a bad delivery experience. So those are some ways to think about what we're seeing here. Um, I, I, I think that if I were to sum it up into the kind of four categories, I would say you, you wanna think about volume and package density, you want to know your carriers and what they want and where they want it and when they want it and give them what they want. Because if you do, that's they're going to reward you with better pricing. I, I really think that we learned from 2020 that you have to be multi-carrier. And I don't mean that you just keep some carrier on the hook a little bit, but we need to optimize those carrier relationships and use them then in emergency situations as a redundancy. And, and, then, and then finally, we have to build an offering for our brand each of us around e-commerce so that our customers' expectations are met, our brand equity is enhanced uh, by what it is that we're doing, um, or, or we're at least building it for what our brand equity and expectation is. Um, so each of those are requiring these, these brands to think strategically around their care relations instead of tactically. And I think it all starts with parcel weight and volume optimization. Uh, talk, about, talk about knowing your business and you know, and the, how the very, very nature of the box itself, the package itself, dictates so much in terms of the box itself, where it's going, how fast it has to get there, and then, and who's the best player to get that done. And then, like you just, you like you just said, that delivery, that box is the experience. You know, when I go out to the, you know, when I go out and get my box, whatever's waiting for me, I'm excited. You know what I mean? And that can be uh, very impactful in terms of, you know, how is the package? What did it come in? What does it look like? You know, when did it get there? Who, who dropped it off? Who pulled into my yard? Um, but but let, so let's talk about the next piece of this thing is, well, how do you actually work with the multi-carriers? That, that does not seem easy. And I know there's, we kind of broken it in three buckets here. You got to work them from a technical perspective, from a contractual uh, perspective, because all relationships are based on contracts, right? But then also operationally. So if we want to kind of unpack this this piece of it a little bit, um, Jim, you know, where, where can we start here in terms of a, a technical relationship working with carriers? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna cover the two outer elements of this and leave it to Casey to cover the contractual piece since he has the law degree and I don't. Um, and and it's interesting because the technical piece um, and the operational piece they they all kind of blend together. You know, they have to work 
hand in glove there. And so when you think about technical, it's not just APIs and microservices, although contemporary integrations and interfaces with partners is critical and you need to select your providers based on those that can help you um, with these more contemporary interfaces to go faster and to integrate cheaper um, and to make these things work in, in a more contemporary environment. But the other piece of the technology that's really critical is the, the chart that Casey just walked you through. To be able to take in your demand for what you're doing today and to really analyze that in a way that gives you a very clean picture of what you're trying to accomplish and then from there to be thinking through which are the carriers that best suit the different pieces when you segment it out in the way that Casey just walked us through. That happens through some very sophisticated technology that enables you to then think strategically about this very issue of you know, carrier management and multi-carrier strategies. And then on the execution operation side, you need to deploy this in your environments today. So how do you connect this new multi-carrier rate chart into your warehouse operations so you can do real-time rate shopping, API calls, bring them back, and actually induct that specific package into the most optimized carrier and do that in real time because although you have a rate chart you know that's great but ultimately it has to connect to that specific package that you want to move out your door and move it out your door in the most optimized way so real-time rate chart uh, capability um, multi-carrier labeling all of those pieces are really critical technologies on the operational side. And then the last piece is to have a partner that can work and understand what the expected volumes are gonna be for each of these carriers based on how the demand is, is shaping up as you move forward. And then to schedule those pickups so you actually have the capacity you need at the back door so you can pull out and start inducting into those systems. Again, it's an operational element, but it's also a very highly technical element in order to be able to do that. And then lastly, your contracts with your vendors need to allow for this multi-carrier solution. And I'm gonna have Casey talk to you a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll take uh, put on my lawyer hat when I get to the contract part, Jim. Um, but I, I do want to touch really briefly on on the technical and operational things you mentioned, uh, because it, it, it has never been a, an easier time to be multi-carrier. It's not that long ago, maybe maybe for many shippers, uh, less than five years, uh, that all of your uh, lease cost routing was done off of tables, and that's really problematic. When, when the carrier invoice had 40 to 45 percent of, of the uh, charges on the invoice uh, come after uh, that rate table. So you were really doing an analysis on half the cost and try and hoping that that was a consistent analysis. But now you really can do landed cost, least cost routing, and you can do it in real time. And those APIs, those multi-carrier APIs can integrate directly to your print and apply mechanisms and, and put a UPS parcel label on a package and then a USPS one on the next package, get a regional carrier, do, do purple, do whomever, and just constantly uh, go out to get the actual landed cost. So there's never been a better time because of APIs, uh, because of those microservices, never been a better time to be multi-carrier from a technical perspective. Um, I will say operationally, um, you may need to cut yourself an extra dock door now and then if you really get into the multi-carrier space and you have a lot of volume, you may need a few extra dock doors. Um, but speaking to the contractual piece, I know I, I've been talking with a lot of people the last few weeks and and those people have been uh, pointing out to me the difficulty that they had in 2020 when they had a, a contract with a carrier that required them to put nearly 100% or even 100% of their volume on that carrier. So the contract requires them to put it on it and, and then the carrier was un, unable to pick up that tender. And, and 
that's really a problematic lack of flexibility. So when we talk about contractually, and we talk about um, a multi-carrier last mile from a contractual standpoint, what I think of is how flexible does my contract need to be? What language do I need to include uh, for these sorts of unexpected events? Right. Um, and, and how can I use that language um, in, in an unexpected event, whether it's, it's a hurricane or a global pandemic? How can I flex around um, the, whatever is constraining my primary carrier and shift that volume to a secondary carrier? Because at the end of the day, uh, we all have to be very customer focused in e-commerce. And, and I, I remember in the peak of 2020 um, with our own warehouses um, and, and we were looking at, at millions of parcels per month. So hundreds of thousands of parcels per day. And we were over labeling and relabeling sometimes three or four times to manage that carrier, uh, that carrier uh, trailer cap, right? Without the contractual flexibility, we never could have done it. Now, I am not giving legal advice on the subject of how you negotiate your, your uh, carrier relationship, but I do recommend you involve your attorney and you involve the, the prior discussed carrier strategy and, and look at that as you're figuring out how you're going to negotiate uh, those contracts, but remain as flexible as you can uh, while still optimizing your discounts. Casey, I'm disappointed of the disclaimer. I know this is your favorite negotiating item, and I was going to offer up your services pro bono to anybody <laughs> that wanted to have some advice and engage in this. No, they 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 taught me in my my first firm I worked at that you you never give a blanket legal advice to a large group of people. So <laughs> nothing of nothing that I have said is legal advice. <laughs> well, and with that. So I guess people are going to be asking for advice now because we're going to go into the Q&A session here. Um, and we're, we're right moving on time. So just want to remind the audience, go ahead and please submit in the chat your questions. Our moderators will you know, take a look at the questions and we'll kind of bring them in here and, and for the crowd um, to take a look at. So I'm going to be looking at the Q&A section here and pulling them out. So <clears throat> let's see what we got here in the pipeline. Um, uh, first question, what is the MERSC deliver capacity? Jim, do you want to take that or should I? You could go do that. I'm not sure I understand the deliver capacity. What is the MERSC deliver capacity? I mean, the, yeah, I guess within the e-commerce world, right? Within within the universe of e-commerce delivery, what would you say it is? What new capacity do we bring to that space? Um, uh, that's that's how I understand it. I'll I'll, I'll uh, frame the question and then I'll answer the question that I framed. So, um, Maersk in its acquisition of Visible Supply Chain uh, acquired uh, excellent carrier relationships with the U.S. Postal Service, UPS, FedEx, and many regional carriers. Uh, we use that network of carriers um, to to do everything from micro e-commerce businesses uh, all the way up to uh, millions of parcels. Uh, per month customers. Um, and it, it represented about 220 million parcels per year uh, that were running through our system. Um, we also have the capacity and have done for customers um, a first and middle mile play uh, where we are picking up parcels from uh, a, a customer's dock and moving that through uh, the middle mile and then inducting it to the carrier. Uh, as I pointed out below those tra uh, before, those trailer caps can be very problematic, but one way that you can help a carrier and optimize your customer experience, especially optimize that time and transit customer experience, is by having a, a first and middle mile uh, carrier within the domestic U.S. that can work in cooperation with your final mile carrier. So we do have the ability to help with that, um, and, and, I, and I think that that ability is dramatically expanding with some of the acquisitions that Maersk has been making. Uh, so so we, we have the ability to help our customers. Uh, we have hundreds of millions of parcels going through our system currently. Um, are we a final mile carrier uh, where we're delivering small parcels a la USPS, UPS, FedEx, Amazon, uh, like the slide I showed earlier? No, we're not doing that. We're leveraging our relationships and partnerships with them. Uh, 
And we're also allowing our customers to leverage our volume. Uh, and so that allows them where they might have smaller volume or smaller density to take advantage of what Maersk's other customers are doing and, what, and that network the visible supply chain built out in order to optimize the spend uh, and optimize their ability to use more carriers maybe than their volume would otherwise allow them to use. So hopefully I answered the reframed question and, and it answered uh, the question you originally asked. Uh, it's good. I guess we can keep on the theme around, around um, here's a theme that's coming up around cost, right? Cost is always a major factor here. And one of the questions here is the USPS is quite expensive compared to FedEx or UPS. Where is Maersk positioned? And I think it goes back to what you were saying, Casey, it's about relationships we're maintaining. So um, talk a little bit about um, what's considered UPS expensive compared to FedEx or UPS and where where does where does we play in the middle of that from a cost perspective? Yeah, well, well, first I'll I'll address the statement that the USPS is quite expensive compared to UPS and FedEx. Um, UPS, FedEx, DHL, uh, Amazon, uh, they all have used the U.S. Postal Service for final mile delivery. Um, and, and so uh, I, I would say that they disagree with you that the USPS is quite expensive uh, compared to UPS and FedEx, as it's an underlying cost structure within some of their offerings. Uh, UPS, FedEx, uh, DHL, and Amazon have all used the USPS um, as, as a final mile delivery mechanism, and many of them still do. And, and so when you're purchasing certain products from UPS, FedEx, or DHL at all, um, you actually are, are paying for the USPS and for that that primary carrier, so I would I would disagree with the statement that it is a more expensive offering. Now that said, the USPS has a variety of product offerings, and most people are not aware of that. Uh, the U.S. Postal Service uh, has a priority mail product. That priority mail product, um, if if on the right weights and sizes, is going to be a cheaper product than a UPS ground residential. It's going to probably be a more expensive product uh, on a UPS or a FedEx uh, ground uh, business delivery, um, and it is going to, to be a more expensive product for heavy and large shipments. And so all of those things may indicate that what you're looking at specifically would be a more expensive USPS product. But I would also say that priority mail product is, is a less than three-day delivery anywhere within the continental US from a single point of induction. So you can take that product, you can hand it off to the Postal Service and get anywhere in the US in less than three days. That is similar in time and transit to the second day air products offered by UPS and FedEx. So it is important that you're comparing apples to apples when you're doing a carrier comparison, that you're making sure that you understand the delivery uh, expectation for the product that you're looking at and that you're looking at a rate chart on. I would also say that it's important that you look at those accessorials and surcharges that we talked about earlier. Again, they do make up on a residential delivery of 40 to 50 percent of the cost that you're experiencing on that delivery. And so if you're overlooking that piece, that may give an impression of greater price uh, of a greater price by the Postal Service. What Maersk is doing from a price perspective is, is utilizing the right carrier in the right place and utilizing existing volumes and volume densities to give an enhanced experience for the Maersk customers who take advantage of it. This may be a cheaper price, but it also may be a faster time in transit. So, for example, we may decide to zone skip. Uh, a customer and, and, and a collection of customers volume closer to the place that it's going to be inducted. By doing that, save a day in transit or save two days in transit, and then utilize one of our other carrier partners in order to get it to that final mile delivery. So it may be a better price point. It may be a better service. We need to, as we're talking with our Maersk customers, we need to make sure that we talk about what their e-commerce customers are looking for and help them to build the right solution around their products, the size of packages they ship, how many fulfillment centers they have, and what those customer expectations are. Yeah, and I, I think it's an important point to, like Casey is making around, uh, cost is certainly gonna be important, always important, 
but there's other objectives around this that are really critical to consider, you know, such as capacity. We've talked a lot about capacity and having the agility to adjust when capacity constraints become a problem. Time in transit and, and you know, what are the real trade-offs for your business if you offered a three-day product versus a two-day product and you could save significantly in that way? Um, what is the option of making sure that you're able to give each carrier the pieces of your requirements that they like and they want and makes the best business sense for them and they'll reward you with better service better costs and so it's not just a, a math problem um, and it's certainly just not a rate problem as Casey said it's absolutely a total cost and a total uh, structure around what you're trying to accomplish to get to the right scenario Here's another question for the gentleman here. Um, how do you put a dollar value to service when comparing similar services? UPS ground versus FedEx HD. Dollar yeah. value to service when comparing similar services. Uh, is that the actual service uh, of the delivery? How, yes. how do you interpret that? So both of those service types are, are comparable. The, the FedEx home delivery service and, and, and the UPS ground service, they are comparable service types. Um, and so comparing, comparing them, I think it becomes relatively easy to look at that, um, at that cost. And com you're comparing apples to apples in that specific example. But I, I think there are some other things to think about on that service front, um, especially as you uh, have the volume to delve into uh, regional carriers. Uh, that becomes very relevant there. Uh, you may have fewer zip codes that can be serviced. Uh, you may also have, um, with many with many regional carriers, you may have a delivery um, experience that's not optimal. Uh, but UPS and FedEx both give a great uh, delivery experience, a very similar delivery experience to each other, generically and generally. I'll also say that um, you want to look at how that individual carrier is doing in time and transit. Um, in, in your area where your heat map exists, where your customers are, um, because there have been, due to the pressure placed on the system over the last two years, there have been some unexpected um, drop-offs in service level. Uh, I'll just put that out there. and it, It's just the reality of stressing a system as much as the system was stressed. Uh, very good carriers, historically very good carriers have been experiencing uh, delivery pain and, and bad time and transit outcomes on their products. And, and, and so I think that they'll probably uh, recover at some point in the future. But the reality is that, that they, have, they have had some trouble there. Um, Postal Service is a good example, peak of 2020. They had some real trouble around getting all of the parcels that were dumped on them out for delivery. Um, but then in the, in the peak of 2021, they delivered uh, a, a, an outrageous number of parcels in, in 2.7 days. So, so you, you, you could see the recovery there. I expect all the carriers to recover as well. Uh, Jim, what do you think about service as it compares to cost? Yeah, well, so I think, um, again, your point about um, destinations and, and capabilities, um, I think also applies on the origin side. You know, uh, we found that this year's peak, particularly uh, certain carriers had real challenges um, with certain areas of the country in origin. And so, um, although they are, you know, by definition, apples and apples, uh, for any given scenario, there are definitely differences in services and capabilities. All right, we have a, a one question that came in not once but twice, so they really want an answer on this one, but it looks technical. But I'm, I'm just going to read through it. Okay, here we go. UPS and FedEx has a girth requirement for parcel service for e-com companies. Small parcel at 130 girth and large parcel under 165 girth. Can USPS do this as well? That's a, that's a great, great question. And someone actually knows parcel. So congratulations to the person who's a parcel expert out there on the call. Um, <laughs> The, the postal service, each of these networks actually began their origin as something different than what they're being used for in e-commerce today. So let's put that out there. Um, FedEx was, as we all know, a, a really aggressive time and transit air network, for example. The postal service was a mail network. And so as you take a network and you use it for a different purpose, 
it, it does have some serious uh, pain that can be associated with that alternative use. So the Postal Service um, has some oddities around their network. One of the oddities around their network is their ability to pick up parcels and move them through the middle mile is about half of their ability to deliver parcels. Right. So let me say that again. The Postal Service can pick up fewer parcels than they can actually deliver. This is because their mail network is separate mostly from their parcel network. But the, the final mile is where it all comes together. Um, so the U.S. Postal Service does prefer in its end to end offering, it prefers to have smaller packages. And by smaller, um, we're not talking anywhere near those upper end girths that you're talking about. But we are talking less than a half cube uh, is an optimal package for the Postal Service. Uh, so, so that's half of a 12 by 12 by 12. Um, and, and less than 20 pounds is, is a place they like to play. And if you think of it, that's a very logical weight and size because if it's nicely in the, the single human hand and in one of those canvas bags that you see them walking around your neighborhood in still. All right, so that parcel can go in the bag and be delivered. It also fits okay in a mailbox on, on the smaller end of that. So that's what they would prefer in their end-to-end -end network. That said, they they take what's tendered to them. So if you induct uh, within their within their network or if you tender them a parcel that's particularly large, um, they, they do have to deliver it. And you can see, uh, if you go to any of the U.S. Postal Service's DDUs or DSCFs that are very close to Amazon facilities, you'll see particularly large parcels uh, with Amazon labels on them uh, going to the Postal Service for that final mile delivery. Again, all of these carriers believe that the U.S. Postal Service is the, is the best at final mile delivery. That's why they tender their parcels to them. And so uh, Amazon has made it a very, uh, it really it's become a habit with them of putting their largest, bulkiest, and most awkward parcels uh, into the Postal Service at the DDU level so that the, the Postal Service takes those uh, for delivery. It matches with the commitment that the Postal Service has given to the American people. It matches with, uh, with their remit from Congress, um, but it is an optimized way to use the Postal Service. So if you're looking at a lot of very large parcels uh, and, and it's enough that you can start to do a sortation and induct, uh, then, then the Postal Service may be a good option for you there. But understand that in their end-to-end -end network, that's going to be a very costly parcel to deliver. All right. And we're getting close to the end here, but we do have another question here. I want to, oh, they're, they're coming in. People are coming in with them. Um, how how important how important to you how important do you view the DIM factor the DIM factor in parcel contract negotiations and what is an aggressive DIM factor to try and negotiate to question for the attorney I... <laughs> well as, as an attorney you always want to optimize regardless right so so your 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 DIM factor is something you should definitely uh, try to push up as high as you possibly can. For those of you on the call who aren't familiar with the DIM factor, um, uh, the the carriers, particularly UPS, FedEx, and DHL, have identified a a, a density uh, that transitions their their network from volume to weight. And at that optimal density, they will accept either the dimensions or the weight. When the package uh, exceeds uh, the dimension uh, that they expect for that given weight, uh, that's when the dim factor comes into effect and it jumps the charge on that package from the weight zone combination that you find in your weight chart up to a dimensionally driven uh, charge. So a, a different animal. So it, it basically creates a minimum weight charge around certain size packages. Now, as you're looking at your own parcel demographic, you need to determine what the correct dim factor is for you. This is not something where there's an ideal dim factor for everyone. It's the ideal dim factor for you. And it needs to be a part of your parcel negotiation strategy and your multi-carrier strategy. Do you have a carrier that you wanna put those larger packages without great weight on? Uh, or, or do you want to uh, uh, put a, a lot of those, those less dense packages uh, onto, onto one primary carrier. You have to think of those things, but you also may want to not negotiate the dim factor at all. You may be shipping something that's particularly heavy and dense. In that case, you can take the standard dim factor knowing that it won't impact your parcels. 
a good parcel analysis, you think back to the chart I showed earlier, a good parcel analysis has to look at how many of your packages are being re-rated from weight zone to dimension. It has to. Otherwise, you don't know what your actual average cost per parcel is, and you mistakenly believe that you're paying less than you are, which really makes the CFO angry. So there is no ideal uh, optimized uh, DIM factor, but there is one for you. And make sure that you're doing that analysis. And if you'd like us to help you with doing that analysis, that's something I geek out on a little bit. So I'd love to take a look at it. But but that would be my answer. Uh, Jim, do you have a different answer, or is that is, do you agree with me on that? No, I think that's perfect. All right. Well, we have we have 60 seconds, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time here. Um, I will tell you that the, this recording will be um, posted, will be shared for those who have missed it. And if you're on the call, you can share it with your colleagues. We'd appreciate that. If you have any questions that did not get answered, please submit them to you know to us, to your representative, and we'll be sure to get it answered overall. Um, really appreciate you spending the time with us today and on this great day, this Friday um, of a recording. And like it was a live was recorded before a live audience, so lights going off. Bear with us, phones. You have it, but you know what? It's all coming from the heart. Really appreciate your time today, and have a great day. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.